Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Startup Boston podcast. Today is the 16th episode of the Startup Boston podcast, where I interview entrepreneurs, investors, and influencers in the Boston startup community to uncover actionable advice and stories from their experiences. I'm your host, Nick Dupuy. Today, I sit down with Nathan Eagle, whose background at MIT involved doing data analytics for mobile operators, trying to get an understanding of the underlying dynamics of their subscriber base. And while there, he started to work with operators in emerging markets. Soon after, on a Fulbright scholarship, Nathan headed to Kenya to teach computer science students how to program for mobile phones. Then in 2009, Nathan started Jana, which is the world's largest provider of free internet in emerging markets and is dedicated to bringing 1 billion people, that's billion with a B, 1 billion people free unrestricted internet access. Jana accomplishes this through advertisers sponsoring users' internet access and currently provides free internet to over 30 million people. In this episode, a few things Nathan talks about are the technological leapfrogging that he saw taking place in Kenya when he first moved there, why mobile advertising is broken in most emerging markets, and how Jana is different than Google and Facebook's free internet programs. Also, this week in the book giveaway, I'm giving away The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. To enter, make sure you subscribe and write a review on iTunes, and afterwards send me an email so I know you've done so at nic at startupbostonpodcast.com. Enjoy today's episode. Nathan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background? You bet. So, um, you know, originally I was I was an academic. Um, I my my background is on data analytics coming from mobile operators. So I would do that uh, while I was at MIT. I would help mobile phone uh, carriers kind of get a better handle on the you know the underlying dynamics of their subscriber base. So we'd build models of churn and product adoption. So we'd analyze tons of this this data that um, subscribers were kind of just always generating in the wake of everyday activity, and um, kind of by accident started working with operators in emerging markets. Uh, these were the organizations that had neither the computational horsepower nor, frankly, the human resources to deal with just the, the petabytes of data suddenly the subscribers were generating. So, um, you know, we'd, we'd, I'd build these models for them, but the thing that they care most about was something called ARPU, average revenue per user. And, uh, and ARPU is plummeting across emerging markets. Uh, and this kind of makes sense when you think about it. Like the people who are buying phones for the very first time in a market like Brazil are making less money than the people who bought phones two years ago in Brazil. So the average income of a mobile phone subscriber in these markets is going down and down and down. And so these carriers are under tremendous pressure from their investors about like, well, how do they justify all this amount, this capital expenditure in terms of upgrading these networks in the face of ARPU plummeting? And so frankly, they're, they're desperate for alternative revenue streams. Um, and so that was one of the things that they asked me while I was an academic. I was like, so help solve the ARPU problem. And I had no idea how to solve that problem, but I was, I, I heard a lot about it. So how, how did you go from that to, to starting the company that you have now? Yeah. So, um, I, I had, you know, done my doctorate, uh, work on programming phones. And, um, what I saw was this, that, uh, you know, the the impact that mobile phones were having back in like 2005 2006 you know i wasn't seeing that impact um re you know, be realized in 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 boston or even north america or frankly for finland or south korea for that matter but phone like the cell phones were really just starting to take off at that point in time in uh, uh across sub saharan africa and um and so i made a a, a deal uh, with with MIT saying like hey why don't i continue to kind of do this work but instead of having an office in cambridge i'll uh, i'll work in this uh you know this rural village off the, the coast of kenya mm -hmm. and that's uh and that's ultimately how i started getting more involved in uh um you know in 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 africa in general um and kenya specifically how did you choose kenya um, I actually got a Fulbright um, to work at the University of Nairobi, and so that was originally the uh, the rationale to start teaching essentially mobile phone programming. So getting the computer science students at the university to start becoming more familiar with developing apps uh, for uh, you know for Kenyans. So what was that experience like for you to go from Cambridge to Kenya? 
Oh, uh, I mean, I I had spent a lot of time um, uh, in 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 these types of markets in the past. I had lived for over a year in uh, in Nepal. Um, between uh, undergrad and grad, um, so for me it wasn't uh, it wasn't a giant a giant shock. I think the things that were striking, um, at least the things that I really that that were striking to me, was just how people were using phones differently. You know, I was even back in like two thousand seven two thousand eight, um, I was paying for my taxi rides with my mobile phone. Right, you know, we'd have fishermen show up at our our local house out on the the coast of Kenya with the day's catch and we'd we would transfer, you know, money to their handset in exchange mm-hmm. for uh in exchange for what they brought. And um and yet then what I'd I'd fly back to give like a talk at a technology conference in San Jose and there's no way that's that cab driver who dropped me off at the conference would be able to take payment at that point in time from my mobile phone. Yeah. Right. This is you know, we we're almost ten years uh before Apple Pay and and yeah. the, the Android payment. Um and so it was really interesting to see kind of how a legitimate technical technological leapfrogging uh you know how that could really occur in, in the in these markets. And and it occurs because, you know, the phone is like the one device. There isn't a credit card. There isn't a radio. There there isn't a flashlight. Like all of these things kind of have to be bundled together into this the single thing. Um and uh and it becomes a very, very important, you know, part of of you know a, a Kenyan's daily life. And I, and when I was when I saw that I thought it was it was striking and 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 I wanted to start figuring out like well how can we start building apps on top of this this hardware uh that could be really empowering. Um and what I found what was challenging was just that, like, I didn't have any of those ideas. You know, sitting, sitting, just like I was, I could sit in my office in Cambridge. I was sitting in this, you know, village in in Kenya, um, but I wasn't able to really kind of come up with anything interesting or impactful. And so that's ultimately why, you know, how I started teaching and started doing other types of work. Um, and ultimately, that through that work, uh, that led me to kind of being exposed to more opportunities. That ultimately led to the genesis of of the company Jana. So, what's something that someone, say in Cambridge or Boston, would be surprised to know about the people or the culture of Kenya? You know, specifically in 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 a place like Cambridge, where we have so uh, much kind of uh, you know some real technical elite. Uh, I think uh, folks would be surprised at how good the best of the very best uh, computer programmers are in Nairobi. I mean, there, there are some just world-class software developers um, who, I mean, it's interesting when you're, you're suddenly you're 24 and you have a real gift uh, and you're making a hundred times more than your parents uh, and the, the issues associated with that. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh but you know, I think it's the, like there is legitimate talent. Like, like you know, my best students um, at the University of Nairobi were pretty much on par with the students that I had at MIT. Are a lot of them self-taught, or do they learn exclusively in class? self-taught? self no, I mean, yeah. I think regrettably, um, the education system uh, has has uh, at least the traditional one has kind of failed them. But at the same time, uh, they these are the students that had the resources to be able to have you know access to a PC, access to internet, and be able to kind of you know start uh, start their education you know themselves. Can you tell us a little bit more about Jana? Yeah, you know, Jana is a company that. Um, we're the largest provider of free internet in emerging markets now. Uh, you know, we are dedicated to uh, the mission of providing uh, the next billion people who are coming online with free, unrestricted internet access. And so how do you provide them with that? We, we do that through advertisements. So um, we get advertisers to sponsor people's internet access. And, you know, just like advertisers made broadcast television free, uh, you know, over 70 years ago, um, I, they can do exactly the same thing now with broadband mobile internet, mm-hmm. you know, especially in these markets. And so, um, so we provide unrestricted free internet to, uh, to, to now, um, over 30 million people. And we do so in a way that ultimately is, is subsidized or sponsored by our advertising clients. And that's through your app, right? MSEN? That's our, through our app, MSEN, correct. Okay. Can you tell us how MSEN would work from a user point of view? Sure. So, um, I mean, you can think of MSENT, it's almost like this, this, uh, low cost is this, this, this is a button on your low cost Android phone that gives you free internet access. So, um, you know, it's, it's a really lightweight app. 
and you use it to um, uh, essentially look at specific content that we think that you might might enjoy, advertisements that or advertisers that you think might be relevant. And as you engage with advertisers, um, you start uh, earning free additional internet, internet that you could use to do anything. You know, internet that you could use to do a Google search or watch a YouTube video or download another app that you'd be interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the general idea is we want to create a, a platform where people can consume content without incurring cost and at the same time also um, earn additional free internet that they can use for uh, for anything. What are some of the most popular apps? Uh, within MSENT, uh, we see apps like, uh, I mean, I think it, it, it gets divided into three categories. One is kind of the e-commerce and so in a market like India, uh, Amazon and Flipkart are, are two really popular ones. Uh, and then there's the streaming media companies, like um, the Spotify's of the world. But like in India, um, you know, the, I think the dominant player is called Savin. Uh, and they're a local, you know, streaming, streaming uh, uh, music company. Uh, and then the last category is kind of the social and, and the gaming. Yep. So, uh, so social would be something like like WeChat, or gaming would be like the uh, like the king, the Candy Crush is the mm-hmm. world. Yeah. Can you give us some specific examples of people and how this has affected their lives? Sure. I mean, I can talk a little bit about some of our early users, um, but I, I think what's striking is just how if you get into it, it's 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 extraordinary how. Um, this app has taken off amongst particular groups of people in these markets. So, you know, now if you, I was just got back from India. Um, if you get into a taxi in a major urban area in India and your driver has an Android phone, um, you can, you know, ask him to take it out and ask him or her, uh, generally it's him, uh, how, how, how he gets onto the internet. And now more often than not, they say MSENT, which wow. is our app. And, that's freaking amazing. So, yeah. like, we don't have to kind of, like, talk about anecdotal stories of this kind of mythical single user or mm-hmm. set of users. Like, we are, we are like, one of the most popular apps in the country, a, a country of over a billion people. Uh, and so, I think we've had a pretty low profile, uh, and we continue to have a low profile here in North America. Uh, we do no business in North America. We do no business in, in Western Europe. But um, uh, people know us and, and, you know, in the markets that we serve. In which countries are you growing the fastest? India is our largest market. I think probably Brazil is our fastest growing market. Okay. And what would you tell a developer who is considering making their app available through MSENT? Um, I think you have to start thinking about uh, where you th- where future uh, user growth is, is going to occur. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, so that for some apps... Uh, the the app developer is very happy just staying kind of focused on North America, uh, but ultimately, if your aspirations are global, uh, you have to figure out how to get in front of that global audience. And what's interesting is like if you're a you know if you're a company if you know who wants to try to advertise uh, and get in front of users in a market like India, for example, uh, you don't have that many options. You you know one option is to to um, start buying Facebook ads uh, and. What's striking, though, is that, you know, that, that taxi cab driver, for example, uh, when he's, everyone's on Facebook. And so when, when he's scrolling down Facebook and he sees your ad in his Facebook newsfeed, what he realizes is that just cost him money. Every one of these people in, in, in emerging markets, virtually everyone is on a pay-as-you-go plan. So every bite that comes in or out of the phone is taking money out of people's pockets. Right? And so by putting that ad in the Facebook newsfeed and by loading up your, your icon, you just made that person poor. Uh, and, if, and if he accidentally touches your ad, even more money flows out of his pocket. Right? And that's, and that's kind of why uh, mobile advertising is, is, is fundamentally broken in a lot of these markets. So, um, and that's kind of how we differentiate, right? Is, is that, uh, you know, we, if you put your app on MSENT, um, the cab driver can open up MSENT you know, and try it out without having to take that pay cut. Without having to incur that cost, and that's um, that turns out to to really kind of drive a lot of additional engagement and loyalty. Do developers find that they get higher retention that way? We get like developers find that they perceive our audience to be higher quality than Facebook's, which actually, I mean, isn't necessarily true. I mean, the reality is, you know, that cab driver is a Facebook user as well as an MSent user, um, but. 
when they advertise on MSN, you know, he's he's much more likely to engage. He's much more likely to actually start using that app because um, he doesn't have to he doesn't have to take that pick up. He doesn't have to incur that cost, the data costs, and, and that's that's really important. Um, so uh, so that's that's why we think we generally um, do pretty well when it comes to those types of comparisons. Google and Facebook offer um, you know, free internet services mm-hmm. in emerging markets. Can you tell about the differences between Jana and those programs? Sure. I mean, so so Google has a, an initiative called uh, I think it's Project Loon, where they're they're trying to uh, launch uh, balloons and 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 help bring connectivity to regions that um, perhaps are outside the reach of this traditional cellular tower. Um, and uh, from my perspective, that's wonderful. Um, but at the same time, you know, over 90% of, of people in, in most of these markets live within a, uh, the, you know, cellular range. Uh, it's great to bring on the additional 10%, uh, we're cer- but we're certainly not catering to those other, those 10% that don't live in those, you know, those regions that are covered by yeah. the operators. Um, so from my perspective, it's a wonderful initiative. Now, Facebook has something called free basics, you know, part of their internet.org initiative. And um, what that enables people to get is, is free access to Facebook. Um, and it's kind of a, you know, to some degree, a stripped down version of Facebook. And there's some additional services as well. But for the most part, people just, just use Facebook. And, and that's, I think that's a great service too. Um, but what's striking is, you know, if you go back to that cab driver in India, um, he uses Facebook. And so he'll, he'll use the, uh, the free basic service. But he also wants to do a Google search. Right. He he also wants to watch a video. He also wants to try out a different app, um, and and ultimately that's why he uses MSent um, because we provide him unrestricted internet access. He can he we we essentially are putting money into his account that he can use for for literally anything, and um, and then if you just look at the numbers, I mean that is why we have so many more users than they do. Is that I think the 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 value. Um, is uh, providing unrestricted free internet access versus very restricted connectivity. Um, it's just it's just better. Eighty five percent of the world's mobile users are on restrictive pay as you go plans. How does this affect the current worldwide app market, and how do you see this changing over the next ten years? I think uh, data is always going to have a cost. I mean, I think in fact, I mean, we've, we've uh, I, uh, even talking to folks here in Boston, uh, you know, even executives that we're interviewing. Um, Everyone seems to complain about the amount of money that they're spending on mobile data, and they, they you know, when, uh, especially when they're they're covering their teenager plan. So, like, you start looking <laughs> at the younger generation and the and the data yeah. consumption expectations that they've got. Um, this isn't a problem that just goes away with development, right? Um, uh, you know, just a, as as we as time progresses, we consume. We want to consume more and more and more. So, if you look in emerging markets, for example, um, the price per megabyte is actually going to have between now and 2020. Um, so that's that's great. Um, but data consumption is going to go up by six x. So the 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 data users of 2020 are going to be using six times as much data as they are today. Uh, and so ultimately what that means is even with the price per megabyte having, people are going to be spending three times as much money on data in 2020 as they are today. And that trend is going to continue to to to, to increase. Um, and so while it's great to start seeing data prices go down, um, from my perspective, you know, there's, it's, you know, the, the carriers themselves can't keep up with that demand. There has to be, a, there has to be some other entity that can start helping offset this cost. Um, because there is just this un- insatiable thirst for data, especially in these markets that have been so data starved until recently. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's the reason why we started this company is to try to figure out how to, you know, how to connect the dots and enable you know, these next billion users to be able to access free, unrestricted Internet. How does the cost of data compare in the U.S. to the emerging markets? It's it's interesting. I mean, um you know, I think it's it, it, it's it's a little bit higher, but not by that much. I mean, and, and you have to think about it when you know the price that that Verizon incurs when trying to get a megabyte onto my phone here in downtown Boston. You know, the hardware that they've purchased, it's actually pretty similar to the hardware that Telcom Cell purchases, or uh, you know, Docomo, or like Barthi Airtel for that 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 taxi cab driver and uh, you know living in Delhi. Um, 
this hardware is relatively commoditized and it's and you know the hardware vendors sell it for about the same price to Verizon as well as to Bharti Airtel. Mm-hmm. And so what that means is that the carriers, whether they're in India or or London or Brazil or North America, their costs are are pretty comparable at least. Um, and so ultimately what that means is those costs get passed down to the consumers. Um, and one of the striking things is just that, uh, you know, so, sometimes the operators do charge more, um, uh, than, than, than in, in some markets than others. Like Brazil is a great example where the price per, uh, for internet is quite high. And, um, you know, so much so that if you're making minimum wage in Brazil, you have to work for over 30 hours to get a one gig, uh, data plan. Uh, which is which is crazy, wow. um, and so this is this is the reason why um, uh, and and like just that price has has massive implications on the country. I mean, it's the one of the reasons, and probably the the most important reason why um, more than half of all smartphones in Brazil are not connected to data plan. They're being used essentially like dumb phones uh, to, to make voice calls to send text messages. This is not because more than half of the people in Brazil don't understand the benefits of the internet. This is this is because the price per megabyte is just so expensive, um, and uh, and I think that kind of highlights why a company like ours is is necessary in some of these markets is to be able to start subsidizing those data costs to get more and more people who you know want to experience the value of the internet but aren't willing or aren't, aren't able to uh, to bear that that cost uh, to get them online. Do you think that that high cost of data is it causes developers to not want to develop their apps for that those markets? It's it causes them to think that people don't want to to use their apps most definitely mm-hmm. because you know uh, uh, and and in particular like I, I think a lot of developers aren't cognizant of this problem and so don't worry that much if their app you know could be thirty megs maybe it's sixty megs who cares it doesn't matter right uh, whereas it matters a lot for a lot of people in these markets and then in terms of the amount of data that it may consume as the user is using it um, may perhaps in our markets it like you know, in North America that doesn't that doesn't matter that much but if you take it to a market like Indonesia people care a lot uh, and so I think it is important increasingly as developers start thinking more about having this global mindset and trying to build a global audience, you have to be uh, cognizant of, of some of these, these global problems. So how does marketing an app internationally in these emerging markets differ from marketing it here in the U.S.? The short story is it, it doesn't really. I mean, people use the same, the same channels. I mean, Facebook is, is the dominant platform here in North America for mobile app marketing. Um, until we launched our app, it was, it was the dominant, uh, platform in India. Uh, you know, recently we surpassed Facebook, uh, in terms of revenue, uh, to become, uh, you know, the, that, that platform. We're now, we're now the second largest mobile advertising platform in the country next to Google. Um, wow. but, uh, but for the most part, uh, Facebook is still winning. I mean, Facebook is the dominant player in emerging markets as well as developed markets. Do you think that, so you mentioned earlier that, you know, when you were in Kenya, you were able to send money over your phone. Um, and then before you could do that here in the US, do you see anything, any other trends happening in the emerging markets that you think will roll over to the US? Oh, I mean, I think there's there's uh, a tremendous amount of things that I think are, are relevant. I mean, if you even if you look at things like the popularity of WhatsApp. Um, you know, they're getting those crazy usage numbers before the the Facebook acquisition. Yeah. Um, not just because they had a fervent fan base in in Spain. Like, you know, the majority of their users were from emerging markets. And um, what we're seeing is that uh, you know, that's a great example actually of an app that catered explicitly to the emerging market user experience first. Like they made it as lightweight as they possibly could. And it was both in terms of the, the, the actual file size as well as the data consumption that the app uses. Um, because that was their core value proposition is that they wanted to get those emerging market users who are so focused on the price per megabyte. And, uh, and they won. Um, so I think maybe that's, you know, one thing to point out is that that is, that is the path towards growing a very large user base very quickly is, is to really understand, um, you know these 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 users in these in these high growth markets because frankly smartphones in general they're a they're a developing world technology the vast majority of people who own a smartphone right now 
live in the developing world. Um, and so when you want to cater to a smartphone user, uh, people should go out and meet some. Creating a positive change in the world seems to have always been a focus for you. Where does that come from? I, I'm a competitive person, um, and uh, you know, as an academic, uh, your your you know your worth from a career perspective, at least, is um, is measured by the, your impact factor, right? When you like you know currency, like the currency of the realm is publications, and your publications are ranked by uh, the impact factor of the journal that that you publish, um, and and so I wanted to have a big impact. Meaning, I wanted to like make sure that they like I put you know I, I published a lot of papers in high impact journals, but now kind of st- that I'm stepped away from that, uh, I feel like that's a really warped use of the word impact, right? I I think now kind of as an entrepreneur, um, where we're impacting the lives of literally like 30 million people right now, um, that that is so much a better use of the term impact. Um, and so that is what fires me up is that I, I want to maximize impact. And we've spent now eight years uh, going out and uh, building this core technology that we've now integrated into the billing systems of over 300 mobile carriers in over 93 countries. And we can now uh, provide free connectivity to 4.56 billion people. And, you know, you don't get many opportunities in life to have an impact at that kind of scale. Um, and that's that's what gets me up in the morning. I think it's it's really exciting to, you know, go out and get a chance to at least take a swing, right? To have it have it have an at bat uh, where like if we if we, you know, hit the home run, um, this isn't something that just kind of gets to do an IPO and has some kind of fun financial exit. It's it's like we are going to change the lives of a substantial fraction of our species, um, and that's extraordinary. If you could start over again, is there anything you would want to do differently? I would love to make less mistakes. I mean, it's look, it's been eight years. I have made uh, you know just one mistake after the other. <laughs> um, so I think I could probably uh, uh, navigate this path a little bit more efficiently. So that's a, uh, you know, that would be one of the things. What are some specific mistakes? Oh, geez. I mean, we can go down the list. Um, you know, when we first started out, originally, I thought this was like a an outsourcing business. Uh, like, you know, the idea was the same. It's like, hey, these phones, uh, we want to provide free connectivity to people. Um, but what they were going to do, the original idea was like, hey, we can start getting people to do back office work. Right. Um, and uh, and we talked to the, the, the big players in India about like, um, hey, why don't you know, because we were in Kenya at the time. And it was like, well, yeah, like they were super excited about this kind of high volume, low margin work. Yeah. Africans are going to work for cheaper than Indians. Let's just kind of outsource it all and let people in Kenya start doing that back office work on their phone and earn free Internet. That uh, that was a mistake. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, what it turned into was just that we uh, we found that uh, while there's a lot of interest on that front, that whole model was broken because you know what it pushed us to do is trying to find people anywhere in the world who are willing to work for pennies an hour, and like that wasn't the business model we wanted. We didn't want to basically be a company that's looking to try to figure out who's going to work for pennies an hour right. and and put them to 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 work uh, to maximize shareholder value. That just didn't that wasn't part of who we were as a business. Um, and so, uh, so we, we stopped doing it. Uh, and then we got into market research, right? Getting people to fill out surveys, which was interesting because at least they could maintain their margin, right? Like um, when you want to know what uh, a rural woman in the Philippines thinks about laundry detergent, you can't outsource that. You have to actually involve her. And um, so she could, she could hold on to the margin. I mean, we could pay her more because we couldn't find she was unique mm-hmm. uh the challenge on that front was that you know what's it, it worked for a while right i mean uh you know before png started working with us they were literally flying people from cincinnati cincinnati to manila they're renting around land rovers they're driving on the field and doing face-to-face surveys of these rural filipino women and so um you know we showed that we could uh, we could provide far more uh you know a far larger sample size we could turn around the data far faster it was far more cost effective. It was just better on every metric. It was a mistake um, because uh, we didn't take into account the notion of sample size. It was a mistake because our mission is to provide a billion people free internet. Um, and when we start going with market research, 
it turns out like PNG only really needs to get about 2,000 of these rural women to, to go out and fill out the survey. The incremental value of that 2,000 and first survey is negligible. And yet we had millions of people who wanted to fill the survey out. Yeah. And, and there was no, there's no, no company in the world wants millions of people to fill it out, yeah. sur- <laughs> a survey out. So, um, what was interesting though was that word spread within PNG about, uh, the fact that, hey, there's this cool company with this amazing reach in terms of their technology. And it spread from the CMK people, the consumer market knowledge team, to the advertising team. And suddenly then, where like, you know, they want to engage similar demographic, but they, they don't want to get, they don't want to get, uh, 2,000 rural Filipino women to buy Tide. They suddenly want 25 million of them to buy Tide. And that's the scale that we built the technology to handle. Um, and that's the type of client or in use case that we need in order to be able to realize that scale. So, uh, so very quickly we turned to advertising and, and then realized that just the, just the crazy amount of money that's being spent on advertising in emerging markets. I mean, it's, it's over today, it's over $200 billion gets spent on advertising in the developing world. Wow. And this $200 billion today is going into the pockets of the people who own who own the television channels in Manila, right? Or the radio stations in Bangalore or the billboards outside of Lagos. Uh, it's like the 1% of the 1% of the 1%, these giant media owners. And they're, they're getting all $200 billion, right? And, uh, you know, what we hope is that if we, can, if we can show that we've built a platform that can compete at this scale, if we can just, if we can redirect a quarter of the amount, 25% of the money that's currently going into the pockets of the people who own those those television channels, um, if we can redirect that that money directly into the pockets of the very consumers that these global brands are trying to reach in the first place, we accomplish our mission. We, that that amount of money will be able to provide one billion people with free unrestricted internet access. And so that's so the goal isn't naive. That mission isn't something that's just kind of a pie in the sky daydream. Let's we just need to capture twenty five percent share. Uh, and if we can capture 25% share, we can declare mission accomplished and we can provide a billion people with free internet. What has been some of the largest drivers of growth for you? I think the the single largest driver has the, been the price point of the Android chipset. Like you can buy um, originally a phone like this. You know, a phone. This is this is a a smartphone running. Uh, you know, one of the more recent versions of Android. It's got a touch screen. Has Wi-Fi, GPS. Um, you know, the lowest price you could get a phone like this was, uh, uh, around $300. And that was just a couple of years ago. And then it went down to about $100. Um, and you can now buy a phone with that, these types of specs for $20 in virtually every capital city in these major emerging markets. I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, that price point of that Android chipset is driving everyone's numbers. I mean, this is the reason why, you know, Facebook can meet their numbers quarter over quarter. It's like, it's suddenly, it's, it's what's are getting people onto the internet and it's enabling this all to happen. Now, the challenge is that while the price point of these Android phones have gone down so significantly, um, the, uh, like the price of data hasn't. And so suddenly you've got all these people who have these, who are carrying around essentially supercomputers um, that should have an internet connection at all times and they're not connecting to the internet because of just the, 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 pure, the cost per megabyte. What have been some of the biggest lessons that you've learned? It's probably okay to make these types of mistakes uh, as long as you're learning from them and, and uh, constantly, I mean, I think as long as you're constantly learning, um, everything else is going to be okay. Uh, so, um, so that's, that's, you know, that's something that, uh, it's why, it's why, I've, you know, even if we, uh, we lose a contract or, you know, things aren't going our way, um, I think we are always learning, uh, here in this organization. And, and I think we're, we're constantly becoming better and better. And, uh, and that, that, that gives me hope. I want to move into our rapid fire questions. Okay. So what is your favorite city that you've been to? Uh, it's actually top of mind recently, um, but I went to high school in Nice, uh, in Paris, or sorry, in France, and um, and it's uh, I've I've had a, a a real affinity to the, the the city ever since. What is your favorite app on Mcent? WeChat. What's another startup in Boston that you're most excited about? Uh, I am excited about. Let's see. There's a a, a company called um, Cambrian Power. They do a lot of really interesting stuff. Do you have any favorite blogs or books? 
I um I am uh going for my third time uh reading Hard Thing About Hard Things. Oh, it's one of my favorite books. It comes up a lot on this podcast too. Uh just a few final questions here to close out. Where can people find out more about Jana? Jana.com. And where can people connect with you online? Nathan at Jana.com. All right. And do you have any parting thoughts, advice, or suggestions for the audience? I can, uh, like, a, a self-serving piece of parting advice uh, would be, to, you know, to, to, to make sure that we emphasize and at least reemphasize that um, there are opportunities, especially in Boston, uh, to be able to get a chance to, to, to really make an impact, uh, uh, an impact at, at a scale that I think um, most people will never have uh, an opportunity to have this kind of impact, before, you know, like we're, we have a chance here, um, you know, in this little company uh, in, in downtown Boston to legitimately change the lives of a billion people. And um, and I would encourage people to think about what they want out of their life. And if that's uh, and if that's something that appeals to them in terms of uh, wanting to, to maximize and optimize the impact that you're going to have, come uh, think about applying for a job. We'll leave it at that. Nathan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Don't forget to enter this week's book giveaway, The Innovator's Dilemma, by subscribing and writing a review on iTunes. By subscribing, you'll get all my new episodes automatically fresh onto your podcast app. So make sure to do so, and it really helps me out in the rankings and with acquiring new listeners. Remember, all show notes can be found at StartupBostonPodcast.com. And make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at StartupBossCast. That's Startup B-O-S Cast. Thanks for listening, and until next time, if you have any feedback, ideas for guests, or just want to say hi, you can reach me at Nick at StartupBostonPodcast.com. That's N-I-C at StartupBostonPodcast.com. Cheers.